yo, what's up Vitus Land? This is your boy Dave, how you guys doing? Hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful Monday. We're waiting on Mr. Jonathan Nunez from the Almighty Torch to join us. I uh, want to give a shout out to my boy Chris Enriquez. Got a little milagro happening. My boy Ralph. From Total Meltdown. We got Drew on the Flyers and everybody in the St. Vitus team. We're out here just trying to survive this quarantine, man. Alright, cool. So, Jonathan, you need to uh, join the chat, man. Here we go. Here we go. Man, from the 305, looking alive, We're connecting right. up. Hey, there he is. What's up? How you Pretty doing, Pretty good, man? Wow. Chilling. Nice to be over here. Yeah, man. Dude, look at all this gear behind you, man. This is a good look. You, We, we got, mm -hmm. like, a pro setup back here. Just trying to figure it out. Trying to get better at these video things. Yeah, for, I think all of us really are, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think everyone's like, man, my, my production values are, are kind of off, man. Jonathan, yeah. it's great to see you. Um, hey, my goodness, man. Glad to see you. You're healthy. Yeah. You look healthy. Yeah, yeah, man. You know, we're, you know, we're holding it down. We're doing, we're doing the best we can um, and, and all that. So we're going to just start off, man, with a, a pretty simple question that uh, I've been asking everybody at the beginning of these things is, you know, uh, I think, you know, we're all kind of looking to uh, qualify, uh, you know, kind of how long we've been inside. Time seems a little bit like a weird construct, right? So uh, yeah. do you know where you were supposed to be today? I feel like a lot of band people, uh, you know, would be on tour or whatever. You got any ideas? We were supposed to be, I think the last show would have been April 16th or 17th uh, at Roadburn. Uh, oh, yeah. So... Yeah. I mean, I'm realizing now after being home or, I mean, I'm bouncing between the studio, the apartment, and uh, a couple of times I went out and uh, rid, uh, rode the horse with my, my girlfriend out on the farm and shit. So, been doing stuff, but definitely not trying to, you know, walking the dog necessities, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. But it's it's times like these are like, holy shit, that tour, what, <laughs> this was so long, like so much has happened, and I mean... A lot of it not good, obviously. But, yeah, um, yeah. And you're just like, you're sitting there and you're like, and now I'm riding a horse with my yeah. girlfriend when I would have been in, in Tilburg. Like, what, what, are we, what are we really uh, talking about here? Yeah, it's it's just a really like a, 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 an amazing amount of, of dissonance that like we've all kind of gone through. Um, so yeah, man, we're going to just, we're going to start from, 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 the, from the way back, man. You know, like, let, let's just go way back to, to early growing up. So, are you a Miami native? Yeah, yeah, born and raised. I was actually born on Miami Beach, uh, not on the beach, but at a hospital out there. And uh, yeah, just born and raised. I, I've moved around a bit. I spent, I mean, most of the, uh, the time that I was living in Gainesville, um, I was actually I had a room with uh, my good friends, uh, Rick, Rick Smith, our drummer's brother, uh, Dub, and uh, the singer from Post Teams, our good friend Tony. They had a really awesome spot, so I had a room there. Uh, but I was, we were touring so much, I just had a room there, and then all the gear and all that stuff. I had it set up at Black Bear, and after a bunch of fucking touring and all that shit, and I might even the house. Uh, what do you call this? Uh, I moved out to LA for about three years, and then uh, me and my girlfriend moved back. And now, I don't know, just like anyone else, I think there's a, a ton of. Uh, reflecting and thinking and i think the next move might be a chunk of land outside gaysville set up the studio but also do kind of like a retreat getaway thing where there's like horses and lakes and creeks and like i don't know man this shit's put a lot of things into perspective and i i know all right, it is like pretty it's pretty in, it's pretty intense that way for sure i feel like everyone's yeah. just got all this time to reflect um, on all sorts of stuff, you know. Um, so, what was it like growing up in Miami, man? You know, I'm I'm from New York. I'm from Long Island and stuff like that. And uh, you know, we're both you know Latino. Uh, I'm first generation. Are you first generation too? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. So my parents were from Colombia, uh, from Bogota, and okay. so 
you know, I, I you know, a lot of my earliest uh, memories of music and stuff is not English song music. You know, is that sort oh. of the same for you? How was it? How how were is your, your your beginnings? Just like your early musical memories. For me, uh, it's a very similar experience. There was, I mean, my parents, they uh, they definitely would play you know, American music and stuff, but parties, like, popping up, fucking Cuban parties would always be, like, salsa, merengue. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Like, I mean, that the flavor and energy was through the roof. And uh, Power 96, exactly. Uh, I was yeah. in that. But, you know, when I was growing up, they played some rock stuff, too. You know, Spin Doctors. No, I'm sure. Yeah. But, um, what do you call this? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, like, English. Cheers. Uh, English is not my first language. It's a um, second language and yeah, always surrounded. And, uh, you know, we speak Spanglish. So we'll speak Spanish and we'll switch to English back and forth, you know? And yeah. I think it's made like kind of like a, a unique, oh shit, my cousin, pool parties, definitely. That's yeah. his, his dad is a fucking, the, the guy that would bring the party. And then he, later on, he started playing horns over the music and shit. Uh, but it was a great time to grow up. And I feel like I, I got like this whole, kind of excitement for music and energy and all this where um the rock stuff kind of came later for me you know yeah yeah sure um was it something were you kind of surrounded by a lot of people who are musicians like in your family or things like that or was it just more like hey uh, I'm, I'm one of the first people to be playing instruments like in my family and stuff. well yeah honestly like my grandfather said that he would play um El tre. It was like a three string guitar, but mm -hmm. I think it's I mean, probably anybody could grab it and like jam, you know, you're kind of yeah. like ensemble that's like throwing them back. But yeah, I think I was actually, and I think it kind of came out of nowhere. Even every once in a while, I think about like, how the hell did I end up doing this shit? Like for real? Cause it was the, uh, what do you call this? Um, it's like I'm trying to read like the comments and do. Yeah, um, no, no. Keep keep trying to me. Hey, uh, guys, if you guys want to want to ask a question, right? There's this little question mark box on the bottom. You could put your questions into there, and I will get to them, and I can show them on the screen and do all sorts of fun stuff, right? So put your questions in the little question box, and we'll return to that later. Awesome. So, so as but we yeah, saying, it was kind of like you know. Uh, around like 11, 12 years old, riding in the car with my dad, going to the farm probably. And just, uh, it was like a few songs back to back that just made it clear that I'm like, I need to try this guitar shit out. And uh, mm. you know, what, 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 what was that that grabbed you? The last song before I opened my mouth was Unchained by Van Halen. I was just oh, like, wow. I was like, damn, listen to that shit, man. What the fuck? So, um, I told my dad after this song, I'm like, hey, I think I want to try playing guitar. And he's like, well, man, you want to be like these people? You think you'll rock and roll? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with this, if anything's going to happen. But I'm like, can we give it a shot? Let's, I mean, I'll, I, you know, I'll do errands. I'll clean the horse stall. I'll do whatever we got to do here. I'll, I need something to try this whole, something's telling me I should check it out anyway. So, of course, just like anybody at that age, you know, it's like, all right, let's do the acoustic. And then if you don't get bored, then we'll go like, shit. I'm like, I kind of knew it was coming. I'm like, all right, fuck. Mm. That's a very good parental trick, right? Like, yo, I'm going to give yeah. you the most boring, like, you know, what I think at least is like the, yeah. the hardest, most classical shit. And like, here's your test of strength. If you get through that, <laughs> fuck it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's we'll give like, you what you want. For real. So, I, you know, I did that and I had fun with it. And, you know, I once I started, uh, you know, seventh grade, I enrolled in guitar class, but I think it was the type of thing where that was going to kick in like halfway through the year. But mm -hmm. earlier on, I met a, a friend, my friend Miguel, and he mentioned having a guitar. And it was just like, everything went silent. I'm like honed in on this guy. I'm like, I have a guitar. And he's like, yeah, man, I have a guitar. I listen to Kiss, Make Death. I'm like, shit, all right. Uh, can, Damn, can Miguel I... sounds advanced. Yeah, for <laughs> real. Um and I mean, like one advanced friend, right? That like they, yeah, they, they were like the skeleton key for like everything. Exactly. And like, it's a funny thing is a lot of those, a lot of times, it's like you end up going down a whole rabbit hole, a lifetime's worth of a fucking rabbit hole, and they just kind of like that was they trail off and they didn't care about the guitar a few years later or whatever, which was the case. But you know, his father was a Kiss fan and all that shit, and uh, yeah, just. I, I I had to see the guitar. I had to hear him play. I'm like, dude, no way. You're my age. 
we're like not even five feet tall like you have a guitar i need to see this shit and he was like all right let me ask my mom you know it sounds real cool when you're saying that i'm gonna ask my mom you can come over and check it out so <laughs> we, a, a day or two later i think i kept bugging him like dude you, this is serious i need to like figure this shit out i need to try this thing and uh, a few days later, he's like, all right, you can come over. So went over. Um, he had, like, a red Fender Strat and, like, a little amp, like, a, a metal zone. He was advanced. And, uh, you know, it was, like, playing, like, intro music to setting up. I'm like, dude, it's a fucking guitar, a cable. The amp is, like, the size of a plate. Let's get to it. Let's, you know, let, let's let's get here. So, yeah, the, he just started playing and blew my mind. I was like, holy shit. And uh, I'm like can you show me how to do that? And he was like, yeah, dude. I'm like, I was, I'm like, just show me four chords and I'm good. That's, that's all I want to know. I'm like, he's like, I can show you the cover songs. I'm like, I, just give me some notes. I want to make my own noise. Like, so I was kind of like, I'm pretty shitty when it comes to like, you know, playing cover songs stuff because I don't know too many. Sometimes by mm -hmm. accident, like, that's that. Or you kind of figure it out in a moment. But I never invested too much time in that. And once he taught me that, you know, I started playing. Then the guitar class should have kicked in the second half of the grade and I wouldn't do the homeworks but I would just like mess around with riffs and I remember one kid was he was kind of being whack he was like hey man Mr. Bishop what, what what's the deal with you know he you didn't really ask him to take the test or something he's like yeah look at him he's fucking playing he's like he's like how come he doesn't need to learn the songs I'll just stay quiet I'm like shit I'm like and I couldn't read tabs yet so I would watch the other kids to see what they're playing and then I went I went up and I just played like what they played whether it was right or wrong. <laughs> I love that. You're kind of like just cheating off of that. And it's amazing because you probably copied their mistakes and everything too. And you're just like, no, that's the way it goes, right? <laughs> I'm like, can I go back to just playing fucking E and F over and over or something? Um, but yeah, it just kind of like, it kind of just came out of nowhere, really. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, then I got a little amp, a little guitar, like a year later or something. And a co my cousin got a drum set and you know that this whole thing started to you know become a thing like the band practice every friday was like what we looked forward to and then even earlier on i was always the one that's like if within you know groups and stuff like everyone wanted to play guitar but to me i was just like dude people need to play different shit so i got a beat. yeah i got a cheap little bass and a bass amp and i was like yo i'll play bass let's just write music and like to me what was fascinating was the it was just like power like everyone to their best to the best of their abilities playing the same note at the same time and just like being so fascinated with that like holy shit we're doing this you know yeah with other people like it's like almost like a choral moment you're like boom and you're like yeah, yeah dude like, like you, and when you feel that in a room right even as as you know primitive as that might be like uh yeah. You know, like you're you're you're, you're a bunch of eight, you know eighth grade year old kids, but you remember that power. And maybe as your skills grow, you still remember that moment, right? Where you're like, you know, maybe you're you know with Steve like in a room, and you're like, oh fuck, that was that we just did something there, right? Yeah. And that, and that feeling never gets addicting. Yeah, that never gets old. And like some of the coolest shit was, you know, accomplished through mistakes throughout every band I've ever been. It's like, oh can we is like and then everyone plays a part just fine it's like man but that mistake we got to kind of like work backwards and figure out what was happening because that was actually better than everybody doing the right thing yeah 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 totally <laughs> There's I, a, I a broken answer. magic broken magic is what i call it ah oh, i like that broken magic the broken mm -hmm. magic um so as you know you you got you're like dude van halen it was like, ooh, you know, and that started the fascination with that sort of the instrument pursuit. When did kind of like punk rock and, and hardcore and metal, when did those things start seeping their way into your kind of consciousness? Yeah. Quickly, like, um, I would say that the first things that drew, the first, you know, bands that drew me in, uh, like, right off the bat was, I don't know what was going on, but my dad started playing like classic rock station. I'm like, this is different. And that, you know, that spawned the whole interest. But uh, then... I don't know how I might have heard of like a commercial on the radio, but I, I uh, heard about like some um, what do you call it? like laser shows down at the Miami Planetarium, and they would do oh. like Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Pink Floyd, the class, and then like one or two modern rock bands. But I don't know. I must have heard about it on the radio, and I convinced my mom to take me. I was like in sixth grade, so this is actually before uh, the seventh grade guitar shit. And we were for sure the only sober people in there, but I loved it. I mm. I loved it. like the music. It was like the experience, the visuals, you know. And 
it was just I it was a similar thing. Oh, awesome. It's a similar thing. There was a place up here in, uh, in New York called the Hayden Planetarium. And oh, yeah. uh, I'm 37 and I, I'm like, yeah. you know, that's that's my age group. And so they would have like Pink Floyd, like the wall and like only the wall. And then they do all the visuals. And then my sister for my birthday when I was like mad young, took me to like the grunge one. And it was oh, like nice. all more contemporary, like SDP, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, yeah. you know? And me and all my little friends were like, Dude, <laughs> yeah, it was great. I love those shows. Dude, they're awesome. And I mean, after like I saw, say like seventh grade uh, into the when I got into guitar stuff, it was more of like the easier to access stuff. Like you know, at the time, like Metallica. Like my first CDs were uh, Kill 'Em All, uh, REM Monster, and <laughs> which I don't even remember what that record sounds like. And some something else i don't even know uh i know oh, the Jimi hendrix experience how can i forget and then i before that i had uh led zeppelin 4 on cassette mm. and yeah so i kind of had this mixed thing and i was a, i guess i was hustling because i got cds and then i brought them home and they're like what are you guys gonna play and i'm like shit man i think we need like a cd boombox in this house or something you know like <laughs> they're like <laughs> yeah i'm making my technology right yeah exactly so i actually would come and do homework after school it definitely started changing things because, you know, we'd go riding bike and do all that shit. I would do that too, but there would be certain days where I was just like, man, I want to hear this shit again. I'm like, And I would dive in deep and just like Master of Puppets, you know, that one really caught my attention because of like maybe like the dynamics and all the different, you know, kind of like, uh, like Kill them Off classic forever and it's awesome. But I guess I was just like, whoa, these guys can do like different things you know like you know mm, I, I, yeah. I didn't know how to describe it but i was just like wow they can play like the acoustic shit and then there's fucking electric thrashing shit going on and all sorts of stuff so it just kind of was like you're like let me go find that acoustic guitar that i threw <laughs> yeah, in the, in the back cool over there for a hot second yeah, yeah. yeah but i never you know what i never sat down and i never tried to learn them i never tried to shred i mean even like once i switched from bass to guitar i had done like licks and leads on records on on like torch records and shit and like the solo for minions off a starter me and rick worked on that like you know and but on this the last record i was just like oh shit solo time I'm like okay how does you know i've never really applied or like invested time in that you know yeah but but like, i would say like where the back the strong background you know it was building off like the the zeppelin the hendrix the metallica for sure and then eighth grade rolled around, and then like fucking Slayer, Helmet, uh, mm. you know, like Pantera, I guess. And then it kind of like started, and then obviously the grunge stuff, because uh, was always there, like, you know, like Nirvana and all that stuff, even like L7, yeah. uh, stuff like that was always interesting to me. And, but yeah, so it's like that's when that started. And then like eighth grade into ninth grade, it was over. It was like, you know, uh, I, I, a friend of mine was introducing me to a lot of shit like uh, Revelation Record stuff. So like, you know, I got into all that. So like Inside Out, Youth of Today, and then, and then from there also Misfits. And though that was just like I'd seen the school, but I'd never, you know, thirteen. That was the age where like I was like, yeah. damn. I was like, and this Metallica is covered them right too. So yeah. there's like I remember uh, like I thought that was kind of interesting. I was like. I die, my darling. I'm like, doesn't that? That's like another band song, you know. But it was definitely a gateway into even knowing more about the Misfits and stuff. Yeah, like that. and yeah, and that's like a lot of like old, like a lot of like, like whether I'm not sure if I'm fucking up here, but like Motown or like doo Bear, era, like people would just cover each other's songs or they became bass like standard. Yeah. And, you know, so I think that's always cool, and it's always like what I would do actually is get this when I would get the CD or the, or the tape. I would look to see what other bands the bands would think. Yeah. And I'm like, I got it. I'll make, I'll make a list and then I'll go to the record store, you know? So, I mean, also like, uh, eighth grade, I really liked, I was into, um, uh, devil music volume one, uh, white zombie and all that shit. Yeah. And I, and I was, you know, I started, I was, I was like, what bands are they thinking? What bands are they thinking? And then 1997 rolls around ninth grade. It's like, Neuro I saw it like neurosis and hey to my nephews. I see they're saying hi. Uh, but yeah, like let's say like things started like uh once once the late eighth grade, early ninth grade rolled around, that's when we started going to shows locally, a lot of punk and hardcore shows. 
uh, even some metal shows. Metal came in a little later for me. And, um, sure. As far as, like, doing the shows, the, the stuff that was accessible to me, you know, without, like, a $25, $30 ticket uh, was, like, local punk shows, hardcore shows. And stuff. Yeah, that, I feel like hardcore and punk has always been, like, a very accessible starting point, a lot of all ages shows, et cetera, mm-hmm. smaller shows like that. Exactly. You know, and, and you're in, and, and it's just such a youth culture, you know, that it's, it's very contemporary. A lot of the bands are still like super active and like doing stuff. And yeah, yeah it's, it's always kind of interesting to me to see where that, where that, you know, for everybody I've been talking to, where that like moment is that just kind of turns them into like, you know, for some people it's skateboarding, for some people, you know, yeah. it's like through yeah. instrument appreciation and going forward. For me, a lot of shit, man. Uh, honestly, it was Sepultura's liner notes that brought me to a lot of like even stuff that was in my own backyard because those guys were so down with like New York hardcore. Yeah. And um, like I, I grew up uh, listening to a lot of like Long Island, like Vision of Disorder, Sick, Sick of It All was huge at the time. And like, you know, they were like on the kind of the bigger levels, but then I'd be like, oh, what's this and what's that and what's that? And it was like, the and just, it was like a block of text and I was like sitting there like transcribing. I was like, Yep. Oh my God. Yeah. What's and like, oh, what okay, shirt cool. you wearing? What you know? In the nineties, hats were big. Like, what hat? What shirt? Like, what? Like, any gateway to another band? Find another. You know. Yeah. Find it's like Wikipedia without the internet, or something. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. You had to go find it. Exactly, and that I mean, it was fun, and it it kept like reading liner notes like crazy, and like I mean, nowadays I don't know. You know, like back then I would like you kind of know people's names, and you know they would think you would realize like, oh, they think this band, you look, you find it and you're like, oh shit, that's that guy's other band. And, you know, I don't know. It was cool. And I feel like even as I got older and more into the guitar stuff, I would look and the layouts for any, I loved it when they had like the practice space shots where you see like the gear or what companies mm. they think are used. I, then that started becoming a thing like that. And, uh, what do you call it? The one thing, going back to skateboarding, I actually got into skateboarding sixth to seventh grade, and I couldn't land a, uh, a kickflip to save my life, and I went, fuck this shit. And then I was like, I'm over this. <laughs> and went straight for the guitar. Yeah, and you I know, think, a wise decision now, man. Wise decision now, yeah. right? I mean, we're, we're all good with that decision. So right. when, you, when you started, all right, so now we're getting into the hardcore scene. We're getting into, the, like, the metal scene. We're going to – somebody mentioned Churchill's over here, legendary club in Miami. We're probably oh, – yeah kind of going to, to all these different spots and, and yep. hanging out and really checking that stuff. What, what was kind of like the band that made me think, made you think, you know what, I got to get ambitious. I want to, I want to get on stage. And I want to play like the, like these guys, like a band that made you think, Hey, this is accessible. Like, yo, me and my crew, we gotta, we gotta like step, step up, up. To, 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 to go and like be here. I want to play with these motherfuckers. I would, I would say that the, um, there was the first show that wasn't, like, it, it it became apparent, like, in these punk and hardcore shows, I'm like, man, these people aren't, like, that much older than me. And I'm like, you could see, like, oh, man, that guy, wow, he has that amp I saw in the magazine or that guitar. Like, damn, like, they're doing it. They're doing it. And, like, hearing it live and, like, there's the only degree of separation is, like, holding back from saying, hey, what's up to this person. And, like, they're all relatively young. But you could tell, like, oh, that guy spent all his money on the guitar and his amp. <laughs> This guy's amp is like my guitar. You know what I mean? It was kind of, you see these things. I thought it was funny. I mean, I don't know. It's a Hispanic thing. We're like very uh, judgmental maybe. But um, I don't know. I'm not saying just, anything. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I would say there was a cool, there was, there was a show that kind of like, I don't know if it was profound, but it kind of like, it made me happy to live in a place where there was such a diverse lineup. There was a show where there was, um, uh this that i was like oh shit okay this is cool it was uh denny's unit which was mike marsh the drummer of he played with like i mean he went on to play like dashboard confessional avid brothers or and like he used to have a punk band called the agency like kind of like a technical police kind of like punk band so he he was filling in for his girlfriend's band and it was just like this pissed off like maybe l7 but a bit less grungy mm-hmm. type thing so they played then just like a, a uh it was uh the, uh newfound glory's first show and they were <laughs> playing, like crate amps and then after them was um a band that was like kind of like south florida trying to do like you know old school hardcore 
uh, called When Pure Urbans Meet. It's kind of like a, you know, energetic hardcore band. I know and, them. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then after them was Shai Halud, which was a much darker hardcore. It was like, it was like, a more, it was like an evil uh, version of Strongarm, which was a Christian band with the same drummer. Yeah. That drummer is fucking sick as hell. And, and Homeboy, uh, was uh, Chad singing in, in Chad yeah. at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that's a fucking that's a beautiful time period to go see that then. It, it just it just made it just made me really like intrigued because uh the one guitar player had an Aphex twin shirt. The other guy, I don't know, some fucking obscure Revelation catalog clearance item t shirt probably or whatever you know what I mean? It was just like wow, these dudes are pulling from different angles. And the drums were pretty like interesting because they weren't very he, it was never, a, yeah, it wasn't, a, you know, the generic shit. But it caught my attention because it was like this. One guitar was doing me melody the whole time. The other one was like doing a heavier stuff. There was dissonance. And they had a vibe where it was like, you get to, oh, they're all into different things. But they kind of all came together to do something interesting. So that band was like, oh, shit, this is cool. You know, like, I, I Matt see. Matt Fox, shout out to Matt Fox. Yeah. He was the, he's the uh, architect of the of the whole vibe over there. And um, yeah, I mean, when I heard Shai Halud for the first time, I was like, whoa, what is this? You know, like there was a swagger to it that had, yeah, it was just a bit darker and I was attracted to it. And at that time, I think, you know, I think there's a certain time when you're like looking for like the next heaviest thing. And Shai Halud was definitely like on my path to like finding yeah. more and I mean, deeper. And I, I really love the atmosphere that they, they brought to from the artwork to the records to everything. They just kind of yeah. like, had this presence different. that wasn't was different. Absolutely. And like I was just in, intrigued, you know, it was just like wow man. And it's just like before they even got on stage, I'm like, man, these these guys are different. They're doing something different. And then they're like, oh shit, they're gonna play. What are they gonna sound like? Because it was the whole night every band sounded it was in a, a like a VFW and there was only actually I never went to a show at that same spot again. It might have been like a weird one off. Or maybe it, it got moved from a venue to to that one. But it was it was something I'll remember, you know. It was like, oh, we have this yeah. like, grunge, you know, grunge type of fucking riot rock thing. Then like, you know, teeny bopper punk, and then you know these guys trying to do some like, ha, huh, cool. And then after that, you had just dark, fucking dissonant shit. And then from there, it was like, okay, well, like I would hear, like I heard there was a four hundred three chaos comp from uh, the record store that used to be in Tampa. And mm. me and my friends were really into that because that intrigued us more, you know, with more like dissonant, like pretty much like South Florida's version of like bands like Rorschach or like just bands that were just like, yeah, we're not giving you what you're used to. We're going to flip sure. it up on his head. And if you don't like it, nah, that's your problem. Mm. You know? I love Rorschach, but, man. Shout out to Charles Maggio, that whole crew, uh, Keith Huckins. L br brilliant. You know, like, I'm from the Northeast. I've yeah. never got to see that stuff. But once I started to dig back a little bit further for me, I was like, wow, that was, uh, that, that was really big. And so once you started with this comp and like, you started really feeling local scene, you're like, I want to jump in there. So what was like the first band? What was the early, what was the early Nunez vibe? Well, I would say like the earlier stuff was definitely there. There was, there was uh, a band, I guess like, very revealing there was a band i i did with some friends and we actually at one show we played as fest and it, it was funny because we were still in high school like very young like we would go to these shows because one of my friends had like a restricted and he would just drive illegally you know yeah sick. That's, how, that's how we got a 40 45 minute drive up to fort lauderdale where the shows were at that time and there was shows in miami too but yeah. um that's where most of them happened and uh around that time you know we would get like there was people giving older kids in school giving us mixtapes with like you know death metal bands or cavity and like cavity was kind of an elusive thing it was just like damn so close but so far away they're just like they're not playing or it was just a band that you thought it was like oh that already that passed that you know mm. was a thing and whatever but it was it was interesting because it was very different than the at that age you just go to shows because you want to go and like there's nothing to do really you want to participate yeah 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 and also you're just like i want to see you know you go to show and you're like yeah maybe i'm not into these bands 
but what if there's some other local bands or um a band that's on tour that was the exciting thing like which you know and then me and my friend that played in the the band that i guess we're kind of almost talking about we played we would try to go play these shows with these other bands and a lot of them were like house shows and they were, we would kind of get like stiffed or pushed back and the other bands were kind of leaning a bit more towards like new metal but we're like yo we just want to play anywhere so yeah eventually we did play one of those and i think it was like this competition kind of weird weird uh you know thing where we're like ah, maybe don't have these, these guys are coming with something different we don't know if we want to you know have them kind of sway our people or some shit i don't know so eventually we did play it went very well then we played this um horror themed fest in miami beach called gore fest where they had like the most intense shit you ever saw playing like anywhere other than the deep web maybe and bands would be playing and somebody yelled out like Shadow! like hating you know it was like because you know I ha we had the melody and dissonance and shit like that we weren't exactly like that but i guess we, we always thought that was funny but from there a, a few years before or a couple years before uh torch started um it was a lot of like dissonant like noisier angular kind of stuff um influence hey, what was the name of the group what was the name group? of the group what was it the was name of that first band uh Adore meridia uh-huh all right cool yeah so that was kind of like some part it's like some people described it as like it changed throughout time a bit but it was always like kind of like heavier but melodic and dissonant and stuff like that and did like two u.s tours um there were some other bands, but nothing to, just locally, you know, like side products. Yeah. But that we did like two U.S. tours with Rick's old band called Tyranny of Shaw. And we did two U.S. tours. And then towards the end, we were kind of me and Rick and I were kind of like the people are putting in a lot of work, you know, with this stuff. So we ended up kind of like on the on the last week or so of the last tour we did. We were like, hey, I think like probably. I, I think I'm gonna call it, and then uh, he was like, "Yeah, I think so too." And then I don't know. He gets a he gets an email from the Andy Lowe that used to run over Robotic Empire, saying like, "Hey, did, are you interested in maybe playing with Floor?" And we were jamming the Floor self-titled like fucking crazy, and that was a oh palette. man, that was kind of like that was a palate changer. That was like, man, I kind of like I'm interested in like bridging the gap between what I listen to and things that I'm influenced by, and like maybe acknowledging that I could do different things, not just like this chaotic dissonant stuff or whatnot, you know? So, I think sometimes as a player too, you can mm -hmm. satiate yourself too. You're kind of like, man, I'm going up this road, I'm going up this road. And then you're like, man, I've been up this road and like, I know what I'm <laughs> doing here and that's cool. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, like, yeah, like you said, you know, floor, you know, floor, obviously Steve, like, I mean, if you guys, if you guys like Torch, you have to know about Floor, you know, um, amazing band that Steve was also in. Yep. Really cool. Definitely set the agenda for like, I don't know. I mean, you know, people want to lump them in with like the do, the Doomy kind of thing, but they really, you, you have to explore that band. It's a beautiful band. It's like, um, hey, they were 1992. They they were doing it, you know? And yeah, then, uh, unreal. Yeah. So I feel like it was kind of crazy. And I think like, you know, Rick and I are pretty lucky where we were into, we were, we we're getting really into this band and a bunch of other bands. And we always like to why that's the thing about Miami. Like we are, you know, in the van on the road, we'll listen to anything from like fucking morbid angel to American analog set. Aphex twin is a heavy one and anything, you know, our good friends, Mogwai, like we got to tour with them and we're fans of them. Like we, we just, if it's, if it's something that we like personally, we're going to play it. And sometimes there's crossover interest in the van and sometimes there's quiet time where people are like all right you can have, you're driving you let's do whatever the hell that is so i think that within discovering that band and then kind of having a an end to like tastefully bow out of the the previous bands and then like start something new and fresh it just lined up so incredibly well and then yeah when, that's an incredible runway i mean geez <laughs> yeah it's just like wh what are the chances and because I would listen to them like, this is fucking great. It's like has all like things like, what do you call this? Like uh, th elements of bands like Jane's Addiction and like heavier, you know, Melvin's obviously Jane's Addiction, 
some helmet vibe stuff here and there, as well as like a slew of other just classic elements, I guess I would say. That's how I was like, this, this kind of has this classic vibe. It has, you know, the hooks and all that stuff. So luckily, uh, we were able to get it going. And Steve liked that we were able to play differently than maybe their the floor's comfort zone or what they were like what came to them naturally we were just these two younger guys that kind of needed to learn how to play slower and we were just full of energy which was cool for certain things is like all right i see this as a tool and we kind of taught each other things and wrote songs together that you know branched out and it became its own thing it wasn't just like the sequel to the previous yeah i mean to me i i can't believe that the runway happened so naturally because i mean to me, they're two very different entities, you know, like sonically, like for sure, you know, and like there's those kind of more up riffier, like torch songs that are more like in that kind of like up kind of thing that like yeah. they're beautiful and they, they mix like this supersonic low end and then you have like these these amazing melodies that Steve's just like throwing on top of everything. So that first lineup was it with just you guys and then was Juan in the mix at that point as well? Yeah, he yeah, was right? at that point, it was. Um, Steve was trying to figure out if he was going to continue floor, but then he would tell us like, man, I don't know if I'm dragging a, a dead horse or something, or, you know, I don't know. And like Juan was pretty much set on being in floor. He was ready to be in floor. <laughs> and yeah. he's like, man, I mean, that's, I don't, I don't really feel that that's anybody else's call. And me and Rick were like, dude, we just want to fucking play. Like, obviously yeah. we're down to be in floor. No shit. But <laughs> at the same time, what's so bad about, you know, starting something fresh and new? And, like, the three of us were always on that page, you know? And, like, if Floor wants to play or keep playing or comes, you know, reunites or whatever you want to call it, that's your other band. And you can do that whenever. But we can we can definitely do our own thing and, like, not really um, go into a state of mind where we're like, oh, well, does it fit in what it, we're doing? Does it fit into that catalog? Does it mesh? You know, where I think – you know, the Torch has always had this sonic freedom to, you know, dive into our interests in different aspects of like heavy, dreamy, um, you know, experimental, whatever you want to call it, and but still have this cohesiveness. And I feel like that's something that I very much enjoy. And I couldn't imagine being in a band that's not like that, you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, and so when you guys were putting all this together, and you know you, you you guys are starting to play you're starting to feel it how did you when did you feel like things are starting to really take a a turn like oh torch is starting to we're starting to make a move yeah i feel like the that first record all was said and done within a few like not too long less than a year obviously like for sure less than a year i would say we started writing and putting stuff together and it just like we had we had a lot of stuff and the idea was get enough songs to do this, um, you know, this record, and then we'll go from there. And that was that. what was exciting was, I think no more than six months after the first record came out, we already had In Return done. And, like, the label's like, huh? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go. And he ran with it. He loved it. He's like, I'll send you guys money to record now. Let's just capture this. I feel this from what you guys are telling me, I'm excited, you know? Yeah. I feel like once that first one was out, I was like, well, that's done. What do we, like? And then we just really started digging into where we were at that point in time, which has been a cool theme. You know, I'm not saying like we're the only band like that, but I feel like we're able to capture where we're at at a certain point in time and make that record. And then the next record will be a very own thing, which keeps it refreshing for us where like, well, this is where we're at now, you know, and it's still has a sonic identity and it still has like this cohesiveness when like you hear that, you know, I mean, the guitars are probably a dead giveaway. It's like, Oh, that's them. But it still explores the different um, things that I feel like the songs that we put together tend to like bring out, whether it's like heavier, noisy stuff or like really swimmy, dreamy stuff, but it's delivered differently through like, maybe where we're at at that point in time. And I think like the record should be like Snapchat, Ugh, Snapchat. I don't even use Snapchat. Uh, snapshots 
of where that band is at that point in time. And yeah, I think so too. I mean, you know, I, you know, to me, there's a, uh, like still like a binding sound that goes across it. The way that Steve delivers his vocal, the kind of the juxtaposition of the super heavy and the sweetness yeah. and how you guys put that together is really singular. Like, I'm like, that's a torch record. That's a torch record. Like, you know, for sure. But then, you know, when you, you think about like harmonic craft, I mean, uh, harmonic craft is just, it, to me, it's like the, the, the number one of, of like, just pure like harmonies and like exploring the sweetness side. And then I, I listen to stuff like admission and you're putting it a bit more together. Meanderthal sounds like a bit meaner torch, you know, there's different yeah. things. What I think is really interesting to me is also, you know, you guys have managed to keep some of that consistency, but the band hasn't always necessarily, you know, besides you, Rick and Steve, there's been a few other things and you've even switched instruments and you've managed to, to, to do that. Um, I'm kind of curious as to, you know, how did, how did that kind of come together that, you know, you finally made the move into, into playing your first love on the, on, on the, yeah, on the right. latest. Full you circle. Know? Um, I mean, I feel like we were, uh, to we've been, it's, a, it's been a band that's been touring, pretty consistently if, and hits these patches of like relentless touring and after restart what well during the writing of restarter it was a very much very much a different experience compared to harmonic craft harmonic craft i feel like every everybody was like gun ho and like just cranking out the jams and generally when we put records together we have more whatever the record end up being uh, track wise track count wise we had more you know, and then like we just choose what the um, well um he what he likes, what he likes, what I like, and what makes this a record. You know, it's like we got to maybe hold a couple songs for singles, or maybe that'll be on the next one. But we got to make this feel complete. It needs to go, you know, through those sonic and emotional valleys to make that record. And when it came time to do Restarter, we we well. Uh, we always get together and do some long sessions because a lot of us, we're never really in the same cities. So everyone gets in. It's like, we need to make use of these three or four days or whatever. Um, thank you for liking that song. Um, the, um, what do you call this? The, the idea behind Restarter was like, I feel like we did a couple singles for uh, like a Harmonicraft uh, 7 inch. That was like a bit heavier and all that. So I think we had that, that excitement and that that taste in our mouths if that's even a way to speak but i was like you know like <laughs> all right <laughs> it's like i had that heavy taste um but i think that influenced the direction of that record and i feel like while writing it we um we would really um do long long days and i think andrew kind of like he he had a hard time with the pace that we're at i think he, he kind of like kept pushing forward on harmonic craft. He had ideas. He was refreshed, but I think maybe it was, he was, he wasn't really happy with what he was writing and he would stay at the studio. Um, and he just wasn't, you know, wasn't really vibing with it. But at the end he, he liked, you know, he contributed some good stuff and all that. But I feel like throughout that long, long touring cycle, we saw, you know, some differences and what we wanted to do, what excited us and what drove us to want to keep doing it. And, you know, just like mm. any type of relationship, it just kind of grew apart. And sure. it was kind of almost history repeating itself. But, in, you know, to, truth be told, in a much more civil way, um, we were kind of like thinking that it's coming, but that's when the time is right. So we did a European tour. After a while of, of some tension or whatever, unfortunately, but it was the truth uh even talks of like taking breaks or hiatuses and stuff and people feeling burnt out we took a little bit of a break and then we did a tour with red fang in europe and that was great it was awesome but towards the end of it i feel like there was it was a point where it's like i think it's time to change things to avoid anything being unnecessarily like negative or not anything other than like kind of you know mutual and chill so with a 12 day break or it was like crazy it was like nine or 12 days before doing a u.s tour with red fang again and i see people here commenting we uh it was uh red fang 
headlining, us as main support, and Horus opening up. Awesome, awesome tour. Signed up for that. It was like a month in Europe, nine or 12 days off, boom, U.S. And then in that short amount of time, we basically knew that if the U.S. tour happened, it, things might just be unnecessary. Like things that are unnecessary may happen. So I spoke with Andrew. We kind of like, you know, we talked about it over the phone because I was living on the West Coast. He was in Atlanta. Sure. And we kind of, like, acknowledge, like, yeah, you know, like, maybe things could have been different. Maybe there could have been some more communication or something. But I would say you it, guys it was like, up. yeah, exactly, right? It was pretty mature. Um, but we figured it out. And then, I mean, uh, Rick and Steve, we talked before um, that phone call to make, you know, make sure everybody was on the same page and, you know, we knew that it was not only on our side, but on his side as well. But it's just like it needed to be brought up. And then it would just make things so much easier. And, you know, Andrew and I agree that like, it was like, it's. I think it's a good idea that we just kind of like, you know, it sucked for him because he had, you know, he, he was, you know, ready to do that tour. But it would have just been bad. You know, sure. So he acknowledged it. I, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm, you know, I feel free that you're not, you're not on this, but we all know it's for the better. He's like, yeah, I agree. And like, we're in agreement. And st before that call, Steve and Rick were like, hey, man, why don't you just, you play a guitar on all the records, like doing stuff, whatever. Uh huh. Um, so that's the secret in the songs is that you're playing <laughs> guitar on the records the whole time. Yeah, like, you See, know, not, I'm not, I'm not, I, didn't, I'm not, I, didn't, I don't know all these things. That's yeah, really but cool I'm not like not like erasing people's tracks, but always adding stuff. When everybody would go home, I'd be like, "Man, it could be a little something here, a little something there." Put it on there, see what they're into. If they're not into it, whatever, go from there. But they were like, "Why don't you just fucking play guitar?" I'm like, "All right, I'm down." So I'm like, instantly cool. Not like, "Oh yeah, yeah, finally." Not really. It was just like, "Damn, I gotta learn some fucking solos," and you know, I <laughs> sure. never. Never rehearsed or anything, like that, but I was just like, "All right, I'm really gonna have to do this." Um, and then immediately we knew Eric. You know, like if he was willing, that would be a good, a good, really good. Um, you know, just the ideal person. You know, to hold down the bass, sing backups, and all that good stuff. So I feel that it was a good move. And right away, I remember playing at Slim's. It was a sold out show. We're about to go on, and then John Sherman, drummer from Red Fang, he came down. I was like, hey, I don't want to say anything because you guys are about to play, but you realize this is fucking crazy, right? And I was like, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's kind of been like just over a week and this is a whole new lineup. This is fucking crazy. Like, and he's like, I'm just going to shut the fuck up. And he like ran out of the room. Big band, he screamed out to me, but I'm excited. So we played awesome. I quickly realized I needed a different guitar for the bomb string. I was so focused and not trying to fuck up. We played so many great shows at Slim's. I didn't want to have, like, the first one on guitar be, like, a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, you don't want some judgmental Latinos in the audience fucking exactly. looking at you sideways, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> be a pull me aside. Yeah, man, I got to tell you something, man. Yeah. But, um, Papi, man. yeah, it went, it went well. It went, like, almost, like, it went too good. Because I was, like, we got off and, like, dude, awesome there was a certain energy uh some of the dudes from red fang were like in cavella attack which were on no no sorry horse they were uh mixing up the slim shows they were like dude holy shit you know and it was fun great time i had a headache because i was so focused on not fucking up or like remembering shit that i was just like don't fuck up and uh made it through and, like, I'm sure, like, we kind of screwed up a little bit, like, within the next three or four shows. Because, like, whenever you start a tour and the first one is, like... You got to get your sea legs, man. Yeah. And sometimes you get away with, like, you get them freebies. You know, like, the the first couple or first show, you're like, damn, that was a little too good. We're going to pay it back, you know, later. It's going to come back within the first week. But it went well, man. And from there, there was just no second guessing. or We were just at that point with the excitement, the energy, and enjoying it, we were just looking forward to write. We're like writing the new record, you know? Yeah. We were already thinking ahead. Yeah, like past the tour. I got to say, uh, I've seen Torch in, in all of these iterations. I, have to say, <laughs> I don't know if like, you know, maybe you want to like gold star me or something, but mm -hmm. I, I have. And, um, you know, uh, congratulations, but you're one of the bands I've actually seen in 2020. 
And right. that was the first uh, at St. Vitus, and that was uh, the first time I'd seen you playing guitar yeah. on that. And I think that Mission to me had been like, I, I was just r really into it. Um, and I, I thought it was almost like a, 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 a return to form. Actually, I felt like it was almost like Voltron. It was like all these past <laughs> experiences, like kind of put together into some like other shit. Like, yeah. And and I, I, and I absolutely loved it. And uh, Chris, my co-host on this show was like, dude, this new torch. And I'm like, yes, this new torch, you know? And then I, I saw that reconfiguration was happening. And uh, I, th I felt like that show of Vitus this year was just absolutely phenomenal. And, and you know, thanks for that. And that was really cool. So it's, it's interesting to see that because the, I think the second time I saw a Torch was at Harvey Milk in, in Bro with Harvey Milk in Brooklyn. And that was at when you guys were a three piece. And I was like, yeah. man, this rhythm section, holy crap. And like Steve's holding down all this crazy shit. And I'm like, I don't even know how they're putting this shit together, but cool. I'm with it. I'm here for it. You know? Yeah. It was a um, fun time. It was a fun time. We're actually, um, Songs for Singles, I just remixed it. It's, uh, being remastered. So I, and, uh, I think there's a whole new life and energy in it that I think, really brings to someone listening to the album brings the what the live experience was you know sure 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 um so we got about like nine minutes left because this sure. thing kicks you off nine minutes so there's that so there's a couple things that i want to say i want to say first of all i want to say thanks for coming oh. on and doing all this and i want to thank everybody who's been donating to our kickstarter and all that shit trying to help vitus you know survive this wild situation we all find ourselves in um and, and all that and then i, I want to get to some of these fan questions o o over here but before sure. i do that real quick i want you to just kind of t real plug this out real quick because you're making gear right now oh yeah, yeah. all the way to making gear so wh what do we got you were Game making <laughs> pedals we're making all yeah, sorts of stuff yeah amps pedals cabinets it's just because when i switched to um I, yeah, I saw someone earlier saying they really like that one, so I had it in there. But, uh, I mean, we've done – here, I'll show you. We've done so, a few things. We did this uh, Torch Edition one. We did Mission. Oh, art. sick with the artwork. Yeah, it's just yeah. It's tight. And then, uh, you know, this the regular version. It also comes in gold as well, the Tetra Fet. And then uh, the Boo. Which, this nice. one's crazy. Very powerful. And what's, what's, the, what's the name of the company, just to tell, to tell folks out here? Boom, Nunez Amps. Yeah. Simple, simple, beautiful. I tried to come up with track. something, and everyone's just like, man, just use your name. And it's like, there's enough companies with, like, white dudes' names on them. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, too. Yo, I'm with that. All right, so let's dive into the little question box here, and let's see what's going on. All right. Okay. Uh... Oh, okay, this is a good one. This is from <laughs> Star Noir. What is your favorite quintessential Miami snack, and from where? Cuban coffee doesn't count. <laughs> You know what's funny? Blast me. I'm not into uh, for a Cuban. I'm not into baseball. R playing it's fun, sure, whatever. Uh, and I don't drink coffee. My girlfriend really loves coffee, but wow. I didn't. I, there was when we moved from California to Miami. I was like drinking coffee, and it was just like making me tired. So I don't know. I'm wired in reverse. But I say <laughs> snack, snacks. I would say uh, guayaba pastelitos or pastelito de queso and shit like that. Mm. There's some vegan ones popping up, so. That's that's good because you know I changed my ways a while back. Uh, but, oh, all right, cool. Yeah, I mean all the like all those the Latin or Hispanic you know favorites. I love that. All right, cool. So let's keep popping into the question box. Uh, okay, cool. Oh, okay. Here's a good one. I'm dying to know if Jonathan would divulge the tunings they used on the last few Torch LPs. Yeah, sure. any funky tuning tunings in there? Oh yeah, real funky, real real funky, and kind of a, a pain in the ass to keep in tune live. <laughs> uh, funk in my ass. Uh, it's uh, basically the guitars are tuned standard, but instead of a low E, uh, you drop the E down to A, so it's a, a low A, and you're it's just an octave of your fifth string. So you're basically paying, playing a power chord, but then you're using the low string as a lower octave. So you're kind of mm. lo losing a string. So got to keep the riffs interesting, I guess. So maybe. Uh, <laughs> but tonally, you get yeah. so much more yeah. out of it. So there exactly. You go. There's a certain like it's almost it's like a drone, this octave effect. It's almost like the guitar is like doing some tube and throat singing or something. 
Yeah, for sure. That That's pretty amazing. And that's funny to me that you were like, man, I got to get this, uh, this bomb string right for 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 our first show because to me that's so evocative. Oh yeah, it's it's uh, a certain ten, it needs to like it sound and feel a certain way, and then when it when it's right, it's like damn. Yeah, totally. Um, here's here's one. Did you ever play Cafe Crystal? One show and it sucked. That was like a whole different part of town. That was a lot of like uh, like haircut bands and you know like that uh, like okay, like that cool, type of cool. stuff and it was i mean some good bands play there too sure but we played a show and it was uh, a friend that had us on and he really wanted us to play with his band and we kind of we did it and it was weird because at a certain time it would turn into a uh latin nightclub so oh shit here we go chan chan so i mean that i was you know, honestly probably shouldn't have played and just stayed there and fucking danced a little bit but the thing is we the show was running behind and there was this whole thing about asking us to, you know, play or whatnot, but the set ran short and we played like three songs. So it kind of sucked. Yeah. We played. Oh, uh, that's so rough. Okay. So here's, here's one. Heaviest song known to humankind in your opinion. What's, what's one of your favorite, like go to heavy songs. You're just like, and to me, it's the song that makes you go, fuck, like, God damn. You know what I mean? What's one of those for you? Damn. I mean, going back to the guitar, the song that want, uh, made me want to play guitar, like, Unchained, like, the intro, like, not even, like, fucking, there's not even drums or anything. It's just that fucking chainsaw, phaser, fucking flander shit going on. I don't know. There's, it's just heavy so many things. I mean, dude, some of the songs on Kiss Alive are fucking heavy as shit. Like, yeah, that, I, love, I love that fake-ass live record. But, I mean, yeah. there's a lot. But I'll have to stick with that full no. circle of the song that made me want to play guitar. We need I mean, a Torch Live record where we start pumping in some, some like, stadium noise and, you know, yeah. Torch torch comes alive. Uh, that'd be yeah. good. All right, so we're about to wrap it up. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. Everything like that, dude. You're the fucking man. Uh, torch has played Vitus a bazillion times, and we love them. So love it. hopefully we get to do it sooner than later again. Um, but we've been wrapping up with this question real quick. We've got a couple minutes left. So sure. you're in the quarantine. you got to bring five records. What are the five? All top. right, five records off the top. Ambience. Uh, hmm, hold on, take it back. Here come the warm jets, Brian. You know, uh, okay, nice. I'll probably do the Ambient Works, Apex Twin. Uh, fuck. <laughs> and it's then hard. three more. I would say fuck it, Houdini. Um, I would do. Damn. Limiting. Uh, first Van Halen record. For, uh, and maybe. Damn. I'm, I'm stuck. I would Can say. I was experience. Yeah, why not? Sure. Yes. Sure. Let's round it out with that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot on there and it's fucking great and I haven't heard it in years, so it would be awesome. It'd be good. Yeah, man. Jonathan, thank you so much for doing this. Guys, Thank thanks everybody me. who's donated to the Kickstarter. Thanks for joining us. It's been a fucking beautiful time. Jonathan, stay safe, stay healthy. Age of quarantine, we're out. Stay tuned tomorrow, 8 p.m. with Chris. We got Life of Agony with us. Peace. Peace.